And there was a very new YouTube uh, put out by uh, John Venari, I believe, on the youth, uh, World Youth Day in Rio de Janeiro on the beach of you know, Francis the First Mass. They had these women up on the stage right in front of the altar gyrating and kicking their legs and like cheerleaders in really, really hot beat. <clears throat> they were passing out communion out of plastic cups. I mean, this is a joke. It's an embarrassment. You got these old bishops swaying like this with the music. In your old age, don't be foolish. You know, this is just, it's an embarrassment. Put your arms down. and But, you know, it's beyond that. It's just, it's sad, sad, sad that people think, isn't this wonderful? If you ever have a chance, it's on YouTube about uh, Bergoglio's masses in um, Argentina and Buenos Aires. He had a youth mass. There's a woman up there baseball cap, jeans, and she's the cheerleader with this other guy, and it's the gu guitars and the jazzy music, and everyone's swaying, and, and everyone's having a great old time, et cetera, et cetera. No focus on the Eucharist. It's all entertainment. All entertainment. So it's really important for us, if we want to persevere in these times, to not be deceived, because we have to look at things objectively. Not, you know, I don't... It's, I don't like this idea that there might not be a pope. That, that's too hard. Or, that, you know, I, well, I don't want to think about that. That's not going to be very popular. What are my relatives going to think? They might think I'm crazy. Well, people in the world think, you know, you think he's a pope? You're nuts. Are you crazy? I mean, there's a lot of consequences to all these things. But the point is, is that if we're seeking the truth and we want to conform our minds to reality the way it is, look at what the facts tell us. You know, Let's a good go through some of the issues that come up that you hear very, very often. One analogy that sometimes people say is this. The Vatican II popes are just bad fathers. You know, he's your father, you have to respect him, and you don't, if you don't like it, it's too bad. That's not an exact analogy because, you know, a natural father is always going to be your father always father. Nothing's going to change that. On the other hand, if someone's a pope, he can buy resigning. He can resign and he's no longer the Pope. You know, your father can't just say, you know, I had enough with your kids. I resign. I'm stepping down. I abdicate. I'm not your dad anymore. He can't do that. But a Pope can resign. If the Pope becomes insane, he's not the Pope anymore. If your father becomes insane or de dementia sets in or whatever, he's still your dad. It's not going to change. If the Pope becomes a manifest heretic, he ceases to be Pope. If your father becomes a manifest heretic, he's still your dad. So this idea, oh, he's just a bad father. And, you know, you say to Vicantis, you still got to remember he's your dad and you got to respect him and obey him. And, but you obey him in only things that are not sinful. Well, that brings up another topic. We went from bad pope or bad father to bad pope versus no pope. This is in an interesting area here because I don't know what they did in this, but this is a scented, it says cherry scent. I was thinking, hey, that smells pretty good. <laughs> I might use this more often here. we get into what we call impeccability versus infallibility. Impeccability is the inability to sin. Infallibility is the inability to err in matters of faith and morals. Okay, the Pope is not impeccable. 
he can be a sinner and commit sin. But when it comes to speaking as the head of the universal church, a man who's of faith and morals, and he's defining, he's making a clear decision, this is the way it is, and he's binding the faithful, he is infallible. He cannot err. But is it possible that the Vatican II popes are only sinful popes? You know, some people, we've had sinful popes before. You know it. They're, they're around. There's a couple of them. They're really bad sinners. Completely different scenario. And this is where Satan deceives. He's a bad father. He's still your father, but he's a bad father. And you still got to recognize him as a pope. That's the first thing. We've already covered that. This idea of sinful pope. Well, let me just tell you this. What is the worst sin anybody can commit? Worst sin is hatred of God. Why? Because God is the direct object of that hatred. I mean, yeah, the other, you go to hell for adultery or murder or you know, a grand theft. You go to hell for a lot of things. But in the order of offending God, the first three pertain to God. The rest, the rest to your neighbor, they're all important. God covered all the bases, the, all the things we need to do when the Ten Commandments, but the first three are listed first three because they pertain to God. And of those first three, hatred of God is the worst because God is the direct object of that hatred. Hatred of God is the worst, most offensive sin to God. Hatred of God. If someone hates God, he's still a Catholic. He's a bad Catholic. He might be in mortal sin. He might be offending God in the gravest way possible, but he's still a Catholic. Why is it that heresy is different? If someone falls into manifest heresy, if a pope falls into manifest heresy, why is it that he's not the pope? Even though this is not as bad as, it's a sin, serious sin, not as bad as this sin, but it's because of the visibility of the church. The visibility of the church demands that we be able to recognize who is a church member and who is not. And what do you have to be to be a Catholic? You have to be baptized and you have to profess the true faith. So, we're not talking about just sin by itself. We're talking about a particular sin that severs a person from the church. That's why Pope Pius XII in his encyclical, The Mystical Body of Christ, said, not every sin, no matter how grave it is, has this effect, as does heresy and schism, that it severs you automatically from the body of the church. Now, we get into another category or aspect, but this is a very important aspect. What happens when someone becomes a manifest heretic? But before we do that, we have to make distinctions. You know, the it's not like those who say John Paul II and Benedict XVI and Francis I, they're popes. And we just have to disobey them when they do something wrong. I think for this, what I'm going to say now is I'm going to pull this up and we put this on the screen so we can read this together so you can say you read it yourself. Now, just so you know where we're going with this, theologians have taught that if a sinful pope were to tell you to commit a sin, you disobey. You obey God first. Suarez, if the Pope gave an order contrary to good customs, one should not obey him. If his intent is to do something manifestly opposed to justice or the common good, it is lawful, valid to resist. To a, if, if attacked by force, one shall be able to resist with force with a moderation appropriate to a just defense. So, a lot of those out there who are traditional Catholics who say he's the Pope, we just need to disobey him, like Suarez and Bellarmine and Cajetan and Sylvester say, well, we're going to show you other quotes too. But what they're talking about here is simply this. If the Pope, who is capable of sin, he's peccable, he's not impeccable, he can commit sin, if he tells you personally, you go rob a bank. Oh, oh Sunday collection, go give it to my, my nephew. He's a nice kid. Go give him the money. You will disobey. You don't give 
money to the church away to your relative or the Pope's relatives or whatever, you disobey in those things. See, the Pope, when he gives an individual command to someone, he's capable of committing sin. But when he speaks as the Pope and he's binding the faithful by law, that is protected by infallibility. And we're going to cover that in just a moment on the board so you see it. Sometimes people think when the, the Pope's very rarely infallible. Eh, uh, 1854, Immaculate Conception. 1870, Papal Infallibility. And 1950, Assumption. But all those other things, ah, they could all be wrong. Uh-uh. Not only is the Pope infallible when he speaks, ex cathedra is a universal church, and ex cathedra can even be found in encyclicals as Monsignor uh, Joseph Fenton of the American Ecclesiastical Review says, but the point, and he proves it, the point is, is that outside of the primary object of infallibility, sacred scripture and tradition, the secondary aspect of infallibility are the liturgy, universal laws, canonization of saints. So what they're talking about here, if the Pope gives you a bad command, a bad order, you disobey him. But if the Pope legislates the universal church, that is protected by infallibility. It cannot be an error. St. Robert Bellarmine, just as it is licit to resist a pontiff who attacks the body, it is also licit to resist him who attacks the soul, who disturbs the civil order. Above all, it, he who intends to destroy the church. I say it is licit to resist by not doing what he orders and by impeding the execution of that which he wills. It is not licit with everything to judge him, to impose a punishment, to oppose him, for these are the actions are accorded to one superior to the Pope. But once again, they're not in any way, shape, or form talking about matters of heresy or matters of doctrine, bad commands. Cajetan. Immediately one ought to, re to re resist in facie, to the face, a pope who is publicly destroying the church. For example, if he wants to give ecclesiastical benefits, positions in the church for money or charges for services, one ought to refuse with all obedience and respect and not give possessions to those, to the, of these benefits to those who bought them. That was a type of simony buying and selling sacred positions. Sylvestra. What is it to do when the Pope wishes without reason to abrogate the positive right order? To this he responds, he certainly sins. One ought not to permit him to proceed thus, nor ought one to obey him in what is bad. One ought to resist him with a polite reprehension. In consequence, if he wishes to deliver all the treasures of the church and the patrimony of St. Peter to his parents, not a matter of heresy, but sinful things, if he's telling you to do these things, if he's left to destroy the church or in similar works, one ought not to permit him to work in this form, having the obligation of giving him resistance. And the reason for this is, in these matters, he has no right to destroy. Immediately evident of what he is doing, it is lawful to resist him. Of all this, it results that if a pope by his order or his acts destroys the church, one can resist and impede the execution of his commands. They're talking about sinful you know, orders or commands of the Pope, but not legislation, because universal laws are protected by infallibility. Now, having said this, and that's where some of the members of Society of St. Pius X like to quote them. Say, oh, we, got, we, we can't say he's not the Pope, but we have to just disobey him. Or we're going to have to pick and choose. Oh, that's good. We'll accept that. No, that's no good. We're not going to accept that. St. Francis de Sales. Now, when the Pope is an ex explicitly a heretic, he ipso facto, falls ipso facto from his dignity and out, out of the church. St. Robert Bellarmine, the, Saint Robert, the same St. Robert Bellarmine who said that it's lawful to resist uh, the, the evil commands of a pope, he says a pope who is a manifest heretic automatically ceases to be pope and head, just as he ceases automatically to be a Christian and member of the church. Wherefore, he can be judged and punished by the church. This is the teaching of all the ancient fathers who teach that manifest heretics immediately lose all jurisdiction. St. Alphonsus Liguori, if ever a pope as a private person should fall into heresy, he should at once fall from the pontificate if, however, God were to permit a pope to become a notorious and contumacious heretic, he would by such a fact cease to be pope and the apostolic chair would be vacant. St. Antoninus in the case in which a pope would become a heretic, he would find himself, by the very fact alone, without any other sentence, separated from the church. A head separated from a body cannot, as long as it remains separated, be head of the same body from which it was cut off. So you see how clever the devil is 
you know, if you look hard enough, you're going to find quotes to try to sustain or support what you're doing. But, you know, the issue is, and this is the, the, the to me, the absolute bottom line. Christ said to his apostles, he who hears you hears me. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Teach all nations everything I have commanded. I am with you all days. I will send the advocate, the spirit of truth, who will teach you all things and abide with you forever. He who does not believe what you teach will be condemned. Christ founded a teaching church. That teaching church is infallible. And if we look at Vatican I, which reiterated, this is right out of Vatican I, we're talking about this quote right here. Vatican I says very clearly, for the fathers of the Fourth Council of Constantinople, following closely in the footsteps of their predecessors, made this solemn profession. The first condition of salvation is to keep the norm of the true faith, for it is impossible that the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock will build my church, should not be verified. And their truth has been proved by the course of history. In the apostolic see, the Catholic religion has always been kept unsullied and its teachings kept holy. Always. Can we say that now of these modern so-called popes? Absolutely, positively not. And as on the second page, right here. Indeed, it was this apostolic doctrine that all the fathers held and all the holy orthodox doctors reverenced and followed. For they fully realized that this see of St. Peter always remains untainted by any error. According to the divine promise of our Lord and Savior made to the prince of his disciples, I have prayed for thee, Peter, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, may not fail, and do thou, once thou hast turned again, confirm, strengthen thy brethren. Now this charism of truth and never failing faith was conferred upon St. Peter and his successors in this chair. Okay? It's the infallibility of the church. Now, we're going to take a moment before, just going to give you one other quote here. And this is from Pope Leo XIII. We've already touched upon this once before, but in Satis Cognitum, Pope Leo XIII, if the living magisterium, the teaching authority of the church, could in any way be false, an evident contradiction follows, because then God himself would be the author of error. What he's saying is, Jesus said to his apostles, he who hears you hears me. Whatever you bind on earth, St. Peter, is bound in heaven. Go teach all nations, I am with you all days. This is the problem today. We find from the time of Christ and the apostles all the way up to Vatican II, continuity, consistent teaching, constantly the church referring to scripture, tradition, and predecessors taught before, constantly teaching the same thing. Vatican II comes along and completely does a reverse, promotes and teaches now, officially teaches things that were condemned by the church in the past. This cannot be the living magisterium. That cannot be the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. That man cannot be the Pope. If the living magisterium could in any way be false, an evident contradiction follows, because God would be the author of that. If Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, what you, he who hears you hears me, whatever you say is representing me, and you have these men saying, break the first commandment, worship with other religions, prayers to false gods do have benefit, we know very clearly it's not true. Okay, I think...